Welcome to the Jerusalem Lights Podcast with Rabbi Chaim Richman, whose goal is Torah for everyone. I'm your co-host, Jim Long, and now, Rabbi Chaim Richman. Shalom, Jim, and Chodesh Tov, the month of Sivan, and almost Chag Sameach. Shalom, Rabbi, and Chag Sameach. Oh, yeah, almost. It comes up uh, this uh, this weekend. It begins uh, sh- the celebration yes. of Shavuot. Yeah. Yes. The 50th. Right Shabbat. Yeah, the fiftieth day of uh, after Passover, the uh, I I have to stop and I have to pause every time we come to this every year. That that is um, such an important uh, idea. Exactly, like God is, as it were, and I say as it were very carefully with the air quotes, coming down because He's always here and He's always everywhere and He doesn't He's not a person, but He made a meeting. He made a rendezvous. Mm-hmm. It was a rendezvous between eternity and finite humanity at Mount, at Mount Sinai. So yeah, like that's a hard act to follow. Yeah, I mean, how do yeah. you how do you serve a God that has no beginning and no end? That's what the whole concept of receiving Torah at Mount Sinai on Shavuot is is all about. I want to speak about that, but first of all, Jim Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, in the name of Jerusalem Lights, in the name of the whole world that wants to say Mazel Tov to you on your happy occasion of the wedding of your son. Thank you. You have returned from your arduous road trip. Yes, yes. And um, had a wonderful time. Um, beautiful. It rained on the way up, and then the day of the wedding, the clouds parted, and it was beautiful and sunny, and uh, all, all had a good time. And uh, the couple are now officially man and wife. Yeah, and as the as the the new fa- the father of the bride said to me, "It's about time." <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let that pass. Anyway, Jim, uh, here I want to I want to reflect with you for a moment on the rather um, a special kind of a few days that we are that we are in right now because. You know, as we move closer towards the the festival of Shavuot, we can feel something happening. We can feel a dynamic. First of all, you know that the Torah tells us that when uh, Hashem uh, instructed Moshe, you know, with the instructions for all of the children of Israel to prepare for the giving of the Torah, there were three days where they were to sanctify themselves, especially. Yeah. Before the occasion, right? So that actually begins on the third day of the month of Sivan. And this week, you know, we're, we're, we're in between Jerusalem Day and the giving of the Torah. And so for a moment, if you don't mind, I'd like to connect those two. Because first of all, Jerusalem Day was an unbelievable experience. It always is. And it always is so incredibly moving and so beautiful. But this year, it, it might have just been the most amazing of all, you know, because first of all, there was a record 25,000 people. Yeah, that participated right. in this traditional march uh, with the flags of, of Israel through the city of Jerusalem. And then on Jerusalem Day morning, a, t- a, record, <clears throat> a record of all time was broken when over 2,600 people ascended the Temple Mount what a, what in a, purity. What's, in, what a in sight. It's, it's a sight. It is an incredible spiritual uh, revolution, which, by the way, reminds me of a, of a news item, which is that uh, according to a, a poll that was that was held this week, um, more than half of Jewish Israelis are backing in favor of the right for Jewish people to pray on the Temple Mount. Yeah. So that might sound like, duh, of course they should be able to pray on the Temple Mount and not only Muslims, but the, but it's not a small thing. It's a huge thing for that to be a lead story in major media because, and for, and for that to be true, because what that shows is that it's the concept of Jewish presence on the Temple Mount and what that means is mainstream. It's all become mainstream, um, which is uh, a tremendous blessing. But what I, what I want to just reflect on for a moment is that is this whole idea of um, this experience now of, of Jerusalem day, because, you know, it was in the news it was in the news and the way that it was that it was painted in the news the way the media always works because they're always looking for the lowest hanging fruit do you call it in the media and they're always looking for something that it, that just that is um div- dis- divisive and, and destructive and negative that's just how it works yeah anything so, that will serve the narrative that's what okay. it's all about and, and exactly exactly what is the narrative jim what is the narrative my understanding of the narrative is that jerusalem and the jewish people are one 
Mm-hmm. My understanding of the narrative, should I be allowed to give it over, the narrative according to Rabbi Richman is that Jerusalem and the Jewish people are so intertwined that it's impossible to tell the history of one without the other. Right. This is more than 3,000 years, Jim. This is more than 3,000 years that Jerusalem has been the center of the Jews, whether culturally, politically, spiritually, for sure. It's documented in, in Torah. It's even, you know, um, the only capital that the Jewish people ever had. It's mentioned over 700 times in, in scripture. And even throughout the 2000 years of the Jewish diaspora, Jews have always been looking towards Jerusalem. It's everything is always focusing on Jerusalem. And uh, it's this is unlike, I think, the connection that any any people ever had with any city, because because even during all of the years that the Jewish people were not able to physically be present in the city, it still remained their capital, and it still was never declared as the capital for any other people, certainly not for any Arab people. And that's why it's so it's so ironic that it became, you know, the, the, so important to Islam after the Six Day War in 1967, when Israel regained control of the whole city. Then all of a sudden, you know, it became uh, very, very important to to the forces of Islam. So, so here's the thing. We had this beautiful flag march, which was just so inspiring. And you, you've got these reactions that are being reported upon, uh, like, for example, Hamas, the terrorist organization that runs the Gaza Strip. They say, well, they're going to react to this flag march at the right time. They're going to react at the right time. So there's all these threats that they're going to try and and murder Israelis and acts of terror all over the world and Iran is involved and there's a travel advisory for Turkey, all sorts of things. Why? Because Hamas is very, very angry because they, they're going to take revenge. They're going to react at the right time to what? To the provocation, it's called, of Jews marching through the streets of Jerusalem with flags. And this is, this is something that I, I, I'm, I need to talk to you about because actually the subject of flags, believe it or not, is deeply connected to the festival of Shavuot. And I, wa- I want to uh, kind of focus on that, why that's, so, why that's so. But why is it, Jim, that when Jews raise their flag, it's provocation. <laughs> and anyone else raises their flag, it's like, yeah, that's what people do. That's nationalism. That's patriotism. That's identification with what we believe in and what we're giving our lives for and what means everything to us. But when Jews raise their flag, especially in their capital, <laughs> I just can't say it without laughing because it sounds so silly. Because who, who ever heard of such a in anyone's in anyone else's milieu? Like what what people, when they raise their flag, does the world come down on them? that it is considered to be a provocation. I think that the rage that, that they try to churn up uh, among the, the Palestinian people is the fact that every time you do something like uh, Jerusalem Day, it's a stark reminder that they, re- they themselves have not really been around that long because, the, because, the Palest- because Palestinian nationhood is really a fiction. You know, Thank you. So that's what it is. It's a provocation because it's oop. If someone mentions your antiquity and your roots to that uh, precious plot of land that we call Eretz Israel, then that's a reminder that they're just Johnny come lately. The whole thing of the of the of the Arab connection to uh, to this land in particular, in general, in Jerusalem in particular, is a, a, a historical revision. Again, it was never an Arab city, and then there's this whole. Um, concept of the of the destruction of Jewish history that's been perpetrated by by the Arabs for so many years you know between 1999 and 2001 the the Muslim waqf removed and dumped more than 13 I don't think people even understand this figure more than 13,000 tons of what they call rubble but it was actually precious uh, artifacts and remains from underneath the temple mount mm-hmm. in an effort to totally change these facts on the ground they took archaeological um priceless, precious evidence of the first and second temples. And they dumped it at dumping sites. Um, it's a, that's a type of terror. It's a, it's a, it's an, a branch of Islamic terror. But yet the Jewish people have turned that into a blessing. 
that that uh, all all of that dirt and debris, bec- and, and of course your son Hillel was was a part of of the effort to to still salvage. Is. It still is. Every time a friend says, uh, "Can you recommend something to do in Israel?" and I say, "You have to do the Temple Mount sifting." Uh, what have they recovered? Something like well over four thousand objects from from antiquity, and that was the last time I looked at the figure. It's mm-hmm. probably more than that now. So you, you have physical. You, so this is always, all physical yeah. evidence of the long history of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. It's it, it began in what uh, 1004 BCE when King David uh, declared the the city the capital of of his first kingdom. Right, King Solomon, his son, first built the first temple, and uh, that stood for for 410 years. And uh, even today, even in the diaspora, for example, from everywhere in the world, Jews face Jerusalem in prayer. The ark that holds this, the Torah scroll in synagogues throughout the world face Jerusalem. Everybody knows that uh, you know the Jews end the Passover Seder with the words next year in Jerusalem. At a Jewish wedding, you know, a, a, a glass is broken in, in, memory, in memory of the Holy Temple, more than in memory, in a statement that our, our joy cannot be complete. Like the verse, right. if I forget the O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If, if our joy cannot be complete with, with, uh, without the temple being rebuilt. As opposed to Muslims who face Mecca in prayer, even at burial, they're, they're buried facing uh, Mecca. And the fact that Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran, not even once, not even, mon- not even once. And so here you have uh, this tremendous groundswell of... Um, Finally, the Jewish people are waking up in this generation, more, more so than it has been in the past 50, 55 years, because I think that, you know, after the miracle uh, of 1967, the unification of Jerusalem, there was a certain paralysis, you know, like, what do you do when your dream comes true, right? So, we do, so Israel wasn't prepared to build the temple and, you know, nobody, nobody was um Thinking about that, and to, to to the to the extent that it's actually our responsibility and our and our obligation, and because of all of the efforts that have been made in this generation towards educating our people and the whole world about the significance of the Holy Temple, everything has changed. So that it cannot just to think that on Jerusalem Day you would have over twenty six hundred people, you know, taking special special precautions, going through all the stages that they have to, according to Torah law, to to be pure and to uh, ascend the, the Holy Temple with the, the proper reverence, just to be seen there by God, just to show how important it is. And then you have these headlines again, like um, it's called provocation. And more than that, and, and, and Jordan, you know, they're very, very upset because they say that they're in charge of all the holy places. And it's, you know, it's got nothing to do with us. And the United States is, is uh, upset because uh, of all of these, of all of these provocations. And then, the thing that gets me the most is the condemnations that come from various countries. Not only do they use the word provocation, but they say that all of the, they say that Israel has to has to um, curb has to has to restrain these extremists mm-hmm. from visiting the Temple Mount. That they say that on Jerusalem Day, that you know, um, this is a tremendous threat to peace because Jewish settlers. <laughs> Settlers and extremists attacked Al-Aqsa. And this is so amazingly, amazingly ridiculous. I mean, I can't imagine, a, unless a person came from Mars or something, but I guess people just know what they read, unfortunately, and they, and they are victims of the manipulations of the agenda of the, of the media. But when somebody, somebody who lives in Peoria reads this, they think, oh, those Jews, they're so meddlesome, they're so troublesome. Why do they go and attack? Why do they go and they do this? Why do they go and they make trouble? Well, it was a solemn, beautiful, emotional outpouring of faith and connection on the soul level of the Jewish people with home, with Hashem's home, with the the central theme of the whole Torah, building the Holy Temple. So like on this day, Jerusalem Day, which is the anniversary of the day that 180 paratroopers in the IDF gave their lives in this in battle for the Temple Mount, so so we go there, men, women, and children, and it, and it's called a provocation of extremists, and and that's the thing that makes me just absolutely just double over in laughter because actually these were the most normative p- 
people in the world. This is like a, a cross section of Israeli society, people of all walks of life, old people, young people, married couples, families, babies and strollers. It's just like, this is what we do. This is who we are. This is our identity. So what they're saying is, <laughs> what they're saying is that when the Jewish people are connected to that, which is the holiest thing in the world to them and showing it unabashedly and standing up for it, no, that's extreme. That's too extreme. That's not the Jewish people that we're used to. That's not the Jewish people that we can handle. That's, that's, uh, that's extremist. And it's, it's just so, um, I don't know how, what the word is. It's just so ironically, hysterically desperate mm -hmm. to go and use a word like that when you're talking about the mainstream of, of, of pure, wholesome, normative Israeli society. It has to be labeled now as this is, this is something to be condemned. This is a provocation of, of, of extremists. And this is, a, and of course, any, any Jew who acts like they're actually Jewish today is labeled a settler, which I take as a tremendous compliment because it's the settlers, as you know, personally from your own experience, and as every person who comes to Israel and, and gets to actually see the real Israel knows, the people called the settlers, like my children, are the real salt of the earth, we call them. They are... Yeah. They are the people that are that are breathing life into this country. They are the people that are that really represent the hope of Israel. So, so to label anybody that feels any connection to Hashem, a settler, I guess is it shows that there's something going on here. But to call this extremism is like, oh, you mean we're supposed to just sit and let everybody just throttle and and um, and, and just totally overrun and, and run over basically Jerusalem and mow it into the ground like that verse, you know, that Zion has been plowed into a field from Lamentations. That's, that's the agenda. And if we stand up to it, then we are, we are extremists and we are the ones that are endangering the peace. It's just well, so amazing. And again, like you always say, nobody knows history. You know, nobody knows history. And it is this, this tremendous denial, you know? you know, the first thing that Israel did when it reunited Jerusalem after the 1967 Six Day War was to grant unprecedented freedom to all religions. Even, even people that had been living under Jordanian rule, Muslims that had been living under Jordanian rule didn't, didn't have the religious freedom that they had once it became part of Israel, right? And yet uh, for the 19 years, from 1948, from the War of Independence until 1967, that Jordan was ruling over all of Jerusalem, Jews and Christians, and even Israeli Muslims, were barred from their own holy places, even though Jordan pledged to allow free access. So it's just, it's just one lie upon another. We're seeing the fulfillment of uh, uh, Zechariah 12.3. In that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone a burdensome stone to all peoples. You have to choose whether you're going to support the right of a nation that God set up at Har Sinai with the giving of the Torah. He created a, a nation, not a religion, and you either have to embrace that concept or you have to reject it. And if I think if not, then, then their capital, your capital, becomes a burdensome stone. Where else on the planet today can you find a little nation which is physically about the size of New Jersey that is constantly in the headlines in the way that... And constantly forced to, to prove its right to exist, for, constantly um, called upon to, 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 um, to fight for its right to exist, constantly being delegitimized. That's why it's so and burdensome. As far as the world yeah. is concerned, did you know, as far as the world is concerned, speaking about burdensome, like as far as the world is concerned, uh, the history of Jerusalem begins at, with Islam, mm -hmm. which is just so ridiculous to ignore the pre-Islamic history, to ignore King David, to ignore King Solomon, and and uh, it's all part of this of this plot um, to basically to to conceal the Shrina from the world. You know, the other... The Arab, um, the Arab leaders have always turned to violence whenever they're not able to achieve what they want, they turn to violence. This is the same thing that happened in, and when, when the talks broke down at Camp David in 2000. Mm -hmm. That's when the, the Palestinian Arab leaders began the Intifada. 
because it, this is this is how they uh, how they um, conduct themselves. Well, in one of the many many uh, alleged peace talks that have been put together over the decades to settle this question of of the le- legitimate right of Israel to uh, to live in, in the land given to them. Uh, even even by from the 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 famous uh, League of Nations was it Secretary of State Jim Baker basically said as, as we sit down to hash out this peace agreement uh, between the Arabs and and the Israelis we cannot bring up history which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> he said, we, he says, we're, we're not going to talk. We're not going to bring like history. Monty Python. Yeah, it's like it's, like, it's a parody. <laughs> it's an absolute parody. Yeah. Like, don't don't what what is that expression? Don't confuse me with the facts. With the facts, exactly. Right. That's don't exactly. don't don't bring up the truth. Yeah, yeah. It's just amazing. history. History should have nothing to do with you people declaring right, yourselves a today. nation. Instead, we have to deal with the, with the geopolitical reality and with the, and with the interest. We have to deal with the oil. We have to deal with all the things that that are still uh, that are still basically so much a part of the story of placating uh, the specter of Islamic terror and and the direction that the world is going in. Prophets also say that God will sit in the heavens and laugh. I, it's it's like it's a verse in Psalms. In Psalms, and you know, we just talked about the all of that, uh, you know, uh, wonderful, precious earth that was scooped up and, and moved away, hoping to hide some more of your history. How it's been turned around into this wonderful project that constantly re- retrieves physical evidence of of the Jews being in in the land of Israel. It, it's it's like God always turns the plans of men against them in a hilarious way. And I was thinking of the way that you, you look at how the Romans renamed Judea as Philistia and in a way to sort of rub it in the face of the Jewish people and say, we're going to name this country after a people who don't even exist anymore, who used to be your enemy. But what, what's so uh, sort of ironic about that is the, the root of the word Philistim. And, and, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to call it after these people. And now today, the people who call themselves Palestinians, which is the anglicized or Romanized version of, of the name Pilishim, what does the root, it shares the root of the word that means land grabber. It means interloper. Exactly. It, that's the hysterical thing. It's like, the, it's like, it's a stamp on their forehead saying, I, I don't belong here. <laughs> I don't belong here. That's yeah. exactly. And that's why they have to turn it on its head and, and propagate the big lie that we are occupiers because they are literally occupiers. I want to go to Shavuot from here. It's exactly where we're going. And the fact is, like I say, we're, we're in this interesting place now having come through Jerusalem Day and, and so inspiring and so encouraged with what's going on in Israel. And now we're all moving towards Shavuot. And this week is the last week of the counting of the Omer. Right. And you know that the whole deal with the counting of the Omer, the seven complete weeks, the, the, the 50 days between Passover and Shavuot, what's called in Parshat Amor, Leviticus 23, the, the, from the morrow of the great Sabbath, which is a reference to the first day of Passover, we begin counting. This is actually a divine commandment. And, well, we've been so occupied during these weeks with introspection, with working towards, you know, what you and I called a number of weeks ago, clearing the rocks from the field, with working on our midot, our attributes, and the whole concept of trying to prepare ourselves spiritually for standing at Mount Sinai and, and, for, and for getting like a, a clearer, greater consciousness of Hashem in our lives. And it works through this whole idea of the seven spherot, which have to do basically with godly qualities, you know, the divine attributes. Uh, you can, everybody can learn all about it. Uh, it's there's so much information available on the internet. And I myself have made many videos about the subject every week. You can all find it all on our YouTube channel. And the idea is that, you know, there's a certain theme in, in Torah of, of, of uh, our trying our best to polish our attributes to emulate Hashem by, by literally acting like Him, you know, with His qualities of mercy, of kindness, et cetera, et cetera, of judgment, whatever the, the proper blend is, is the question. And it's a life's work. It's an art to learn how to reflect Hashem's midot. So we go through the seven sphero, the seven uh, um, emotive qualities of how Hashem relates to creation. And this week is the final week, and it's called Malchut. The tikkun, you know, the rectification that we're working on this week is about 
malchut, which means sovereignty. And as I explained in our video about the subject this week, in many ways, this particular emanation, if you want to call it quality, this, this, this godly attribute that is shining forth this week, that is, that is the one that we are dealing with this week, is the most important of all, because it's about Hashem being sovereign in the whole world. It's about him being the king. And in a way, you know, the, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai on Shavuot is like, is like the coronation of Hashem. But the, the thing is, you know, it sounds maybe, I don't know how, how easily people can relate to what we're saying, but if you think about it, it, it makes so much sense. Sovereignty is everything. Recognizing that Hashem is ruler is everything, the most important thing of all. And what holds us back from everything, because there is a natural tendency that everybody has that I want to be in control. I, 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 it's about me. I want to be in the center. I'm in charge. I'm, I'm in charge of my own life. Nobody tells me what to do. I, I'm the ruler. And then, and then people take that even further and they think that they're God, you know, mm -hmm. they deny God altogether. And the idea is that there is a massive tikkun that has to be made, which is all of us to basically say to Hashem, no, you're, you're the sovereign, you're the ruler, you're the king, and everything that I have is only from you. It's only about you. It's only of you. It's only, and, and I give it back to you. That's what this week is focusing on. It's about, it's about giving Hashem the credit, giving him the sovereignty, giving it back to him. And, and also, as I try to explain, like, it's about not letting other people rule over us, you know, not allowing people to, to get under our skin and to, and to rule over us, whether it's a person or a thing or, or our thinking that, that there are people that are worthy of ruling over us, you know, because it's not true. Only Hashem rules over us. And so in order to come to Shavuot, really, we have to, really internalize this idea. And this is the greatest secret of all, I think, about the Festival of Shavuot that we're going to be speaking about now. It's like Hashem gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, and we emphasize over and over again how we're going to relive that experience now, how it's not just a one-time thing, how it's not just, you know, how in, in general we always talk about how the Hebrew calendar is not about, you know, a memorial or, or a commemoration, but it's about reliving it. It's about, it's about receiving the same the same opportunity again, and, and it's about the cyclical nature of, of Jewish time, you know, that Hashem gives us the opportunity to, to make a tikkun, to be there, to do it again. So the thing is, Hashem gave the Torah already, but, and he only gave it once, but the idea is that we can receive it again. Like, how well did we receive it before? Mm -hmm. How well, how seriously, how, how sincerely? And that's what this is really all about. It's about being there. It's about being fully there, consciously there at Mount Sinai, all of us, Jews and non-Jews alike. And this is, and you know, the famous Midrash and everybody knows about how Hashem, you know, offered it to all the nations and nobody wanted it by, but Israel, who indeed used this magical formula that they called from the very depths of their soul, Na'asev and Ishma, we will do and we will obey, which is a very uniquely idiosyncratic Jewish concept that the Jewish people were able to say from their collective heart and soul, we, we will do first and then we will obey, meaning then we will listen, meaning even if we don't understand, you command it and we will do it. And the thing is, you know, there is this tremendous, tremendous awakening in the nations as well now for Torah, for truth, for the one God. And so it's, it's a whole paradigm shift now as we move towards the redemption of all humanity that everyone will take part in that everyone will have a major part to play in that Hashem will connect all people right like that Netflix thing you were talking to me about manifest the connectivity of, of all people yes yeah. there is a connectivity that we are all going to be experiencing through Torah and it's time for everyone to give the sovereignty back to Hashem and be, and be ready to make this commitment to stand up it reminds me it, uh, of what we talked about last week. It is the, I believe it's where the, the sages get the idea. We talked about the saying of the heart follows action. And the Jews at Sinai set the precedent for that in saying that we, we acknowledge that this is the ultimate truth that you're giving to us. And it is so profound and so changeable and so not cha not changeable, but life changing, and the purity of it is um, undiluted, and it comes straight from the Creator. That it will 
the, the, the very act of saying we will do means that we will act in the way that we're supposed to, and our heart will follow that. We will change because we are, we are committed to act in the way that the Torah uh, directs us to act. And, and we believe and we trust implicitly in you, Hashem, so much that we, we accept right away that whatever we do, it will be literally the right thing to do and the right thing that will change us, not only as a person, but as a soul. It's like the opposite of, of like you, you have this thing that you've said multiple times in different broadcasts that it, that it bothers you, a certain expression from the movies, follow yeah. your heart. Yeah, and you've yeah. pointed out a number of times that that's like treif. Yeah, it's not a kosher. It's not a kosher feeling to follow your heart because your heart could be totally the, manipulative because your heart could be the Yitzhahara, right? The Yitzhahara, mm-hmm. the evil inclination is also your heart. So, so, but, but the heart follows action is really the opposite because it's saying, first, you have to do, you have mm-hmm. to be ready. You have to be, you have to be able to, to do something beyond yourself, beyond it. Maybe my, maybe my heart doesn't understand it, but I know if Hashem commands it, I have to do it. And then my heart will follow. You cannot listen to this this thing inside you because you you we we all grew up uh you know our our parents have have given us direction up to a point in our life and and if we have great parents thank god the the task is a little easier but many of us didn't and and i feel like that when when god brought me to torah as it related to me as a non-jew uh, I was able to uh, finally, I, for the first time in my life, Rabbi, I felt like I knew the right thing to do. Wow. You know, not not what the world told me to do, wow. and 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 many of the things that I I idolized, I I would I, I was able to destroy them. And you know, this is a this is the thing where at Sinai at the giving. So you were t- like Abraham smashing the idols. Exactly. You and smashed I, the idols that you grew up with. Right. And Jim, I know so many of our listeners are so inspired by you as a non-Jew that you just said your life was changed by Torah. And there are so many people that are going through this now that are basically what is the verse in Jeremiah? Our father inherited us lies. Mm-hmm. Abraham Avinu was chosen by God because he here he tells him in, in the early time of his life, go away to a land I'm going to show you. Abraham didn't have to think about it. He, he, took, he took action. When you study Torah for the first time, when you initially come to it as, as a non-Jew, you discover that everything about the Torah is taking action. It's so much about doing. It's so much about changing. It's so much about confronting and not accepting uh, who we are, but mm-hmm. saying, no, I can be better. Yeah, we need that today, Rabbi, because so many people are being told, you're fine just the way you are. Don't, you know, I mean, yeah, yes, we are fine in the respect that we're all God's, you know, we're God's children. People but- use this as an excuse. But people say, I was born this way. That's how I am. And that's so the opposite of, of what Torah teaches. In fact, just yesterday, we had our Mesilat Yisharim class in in zoom you know on the path of the just it's a very important class and we were talking about this very very idea specifically as it relates to uh, one of the most negative traits of all and that is anger yeah and so there are people that are angry and anger is a terribly destructive mida and so we were talking about that and i mentioned that there's a verse it's ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 10 and the verse says and remove anger from your heart and take evil away from your flesh. And the amazing thing about that verse is if the Torah says, remove anger from your heart, it means that it's doable. Yeah. Because there are so many people that say about, whether it's about anger or about any other thing, about any particular lust or anything, they say, listen, this is who I am. This is how I was born. This is how I feel. There's nothing I can do about it. But, but Torah would not tell us to change were it not within our grasp and that we could do. If you are that person who has anger in your heart and you meet an old sage who says to you, Follow your heart. I mean, <laughs> you're in trouble right away, you know, because because if, if you follow that which is in your heart and it's anger and you haven't dealt with it, then you're just going to be you're going to develop into an angrier person. And who knows where that's going to lead? God forbid. Exactly. exactly. We had a we had a whole class yesterday just focusing on the secrets of why anger is such a terribly destructive force to the human soul. So speaking of action and, yeah. the, and the whole connection of, of Shavuot, 
you know, the most interesting thing to begin our discussion of Shavuot with is the idea that what is the name of the festival? Because it has many names, you know, in Leviticus 23, it's called the 50th day. It's also called, of course, the festival of weeks. Shavuot literally means weeks because it's the culmination of the seven weeks. But you know that in, in, there are various psukim, various verses in Torah. It's also called atzeret, which means stopping. It means an assembly. And it also has lesser well-known names like the Harvest Festival. And most importantly, I think the, the most um, prominent and, and central name of the holiday in Scripture is the Festival of First Fruits. Right. Because it actually is celebrated in the time of the Holy Temple by bringing the first fruits of the land of Israel up to the Holy Temple. And it, and it inaugurates the season of the first fruits. And the whole concept of the first fruits is so important. It is a special offering that's brought to the whole the Holy Temple only from the first fruits of the, what's called the seven species for which the land of Israel is blessed. They appear in the Torah. They are wheats, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. And there's a very moving ceremony, which is described in, in the book of Deuteronomy in, in, in uh, Parshat Kitavo, of how the Jewish farmer, he brings these first fruits to the attending priest in the courtyard of the Holy Temple, and they're waved before the altar, the location of the place where Adam HaRishon was created. And this farmer com comes and he, and he closes this circle of tremendous acknowledgement and thankfulness to Hashem by bringing these fruits. And um, it's, it's a very beautiful part of Shavuot itself is that when the temple is standing is that the main way that it's actually that it's actually celebrated is this is the first opportunity in the summer that we have for, for bringing the first fruits. And what is that all about? You know, it's like today there is a widespread custom, which is very ancient. It's, it's, it's quite old, but it's not from the time of the Holy Temple, apparently. And the custom today is that we stay up the entire night and we study Torah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this kind of has to do with that whimsical sounding midrash about how the people of Israel overslept, you know, at Mount Sinai and they needed to be woken up. And so we, we don't want to make that mistake. And in, in great anticipation and in excitement, whoever is able to stays up the entire night of Shavuot, and that's kind of like a preparation for receiving the Torah at dawn. Mm -hmm. It's very, very inspiring, very beautiful, and tremendous honor, tremendous honor that we give to Torah to show this love and enthusiasm by, by refraining from sleeping the night before the revelation at Mount Sinai. But the interesting question is, you know, if Torah is our spiritual inheritance and it was bequeathed to Israel by God at Sinai and thunder and lightning and the sound of the shofar. And it was described as an event that's profoundly supernatural, really. You know, we were able to see the sound of the shofar and, and uh, this, this kind of a totally transformative experience. Why is it that the divinely ordained commandment of the day, and this is Hashem's mitzvah, this is what how Hashem commands us to celebrate Shavuot in the Holy Temple. It's it's the opposite of something spiritual. It's very earthy, very, very earthy. It's about taking the produce of the land that we worked very hard to, to grow. So it becomes, in other words, a very, very material kind of celebration. It's like the pilgrimage festival on Shavuot, rather than somehow you know, being involved with with something on a on a markedly spiritual level, like 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 we do today, you know, without the holy temple. Okay, so we stay up and we study Torah. It's very beautiful. But then, and the, and I'm going to say the real thing, the way it's really supposed to be, the way it is in the time of the temple, is that we mark this spiritual event with a very physical, material celebration, which is the bringing of the first fruits of the land of Israel to the holy temple, and it's accompanied by tremendous thankfulness and recognition and prostration before Hashem. And it's very beautiful. And also, of course, the first fruits are augmented on Shavuot with a special unique offering, and that is twin loaves of wheat bread, uh, which is basically kind of like the manifestation of, of Torah being planted in this world, sprouting forth from the very earth that God gave us. And it's interesting because normally 
we don't have any chametz, any leaven mm-hmm. in the holy temple in an offering, but these two loaves of bread that are brought on Shavuot, which is actually the time when the Torah is given, they are leaven, which shows again. You and I talked about that evolution chart of you know the of the of the um, yeah the subtle way from the like, from the eight right, right. The, yeah that's the and that's the kind of the idea of of the counting of the Omer and finally when we are standing upright at Mount Sinai receiving. Receiving Hashem's instructions and 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 sealing that covenant, it's like we are, we are free of the constricted animal consciousness that was represented by the barley offering of the Omer. We've counted off, and now we are ready to be free, to be truly free again, meaning to be able to serve Hashem, and that's kind of what the wheat represents. But but all of this is so is so amazing because this is the true the deepest insight into what torah really is and i know that we speak about this often and we can never speak about it often enough how torah is action how torah is more than just action it's this world it's a celebration of this world that hashem celebrates this world but even more that it's a sanctification of this world because there are so many people that are that utterly miss the boat when it comes to this idea and they feel that air quotes here, religion, you know, that some mm-hmm. sort of spiritual discipline is always denigrates this world, is always against this world, is always against anything that's material. And, and that's not the way of Torah. The way of Torah is to sanctify the material, not to abuse it, not to, not, not to give it preeminence, but to understand that it's something that Hashem gives us in order to serve Him and to be thankful yeah. And because we are in this world, because the Torah was not given to angels. So, th- so this is the one of the deepest lessons in the world is that the way Shavuot, which is the festival of the 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 meeting, the binding, the the, the connection of Hashem and people, giving the Torah for this world, the way that that's celebrated in the place of ha- that Hashem chose in the place of the divine presence on this very day is by bringing the fruits of the land. Yeah, that's like the verse. You know, truth springs forth from the ground, right? And yeah. and it's such a, a beautiful, uh, you know, sanctification of Hashem for us to 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 recognize again. That's the the, the sphere of malchut again, sovereignty. Right. It's this world. It's this very very world that we are in. Everything that we see, do, breathe. It's it's refracted through the prism of the fact that Hashem is King because they have a life steeped in Torah, they automatically understand that this represents the whole purpose of man being on the earth. That, that uh, the fruit of their labors is co-creation with Hashem. There would be, exactly. there wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be anything growing if, if the farmer hadn't uh, acknowledged uh, his, his connection uh, to the land and planted that that seed. I mean, it, it, it's the whole co-creation model coming to pass. It's it's so amazing. This it's duality. Everybody. You know, it's like it's like will the real Shavuot stand up? Yeah. It's this duality because because it's the anniversary of giving of the Torah. So that yes, we and we mark it very beautifully today. Unfortunately, we still have not yet built the temple. That's our fault. So we mark it with Torah study mm-hmm. because Torah is the heaven sent word of God. But the duality is that it's also the day of first fruit. Torah calls it the day of the first fruit. And that's marked by agricultural observance, which is the very yeah. essence of earthiness. So how do you do that? Yeah. So that's the secret. The secret is there's no contradiction. And that's the whole beauty of Shavuot. That's the whole beauty of Torah altogether. And that's the true meaning of Torah is that it's all about serving God in this world. And the festival is a celebration of giving over the Torah, and therefore it's a celebration of this world yeah. because it's all about how we serve God through our actions. And so when we bring the first fruits accompanied by tremendous thankfulness to Hashem, that's service through action. Right. And, and that, that shows us that we are, again, especially the twin loaves of, of bread, the graduation from barley, which is, which is called by our sages animal food, and that represents, again, that slave mentality, the constricted consciousness of Mitzrayim, the narrow place. And now with Shavuot, if we receive the Torah and we're armed with that, then we can fulfill human potential, which is what? The exercising of free will and, and, and our re- accepting responsibility for our, our own actions. Yeah. And so it's so beautiful. It's such a perfect way of celebrating Torah when we bring the first fruits because, you know, our efforts in this world 
coupled with God's blessing in this very physical world is, is all that matters. And so the entire purpose of Torah is that we can elevate this world. It marks the, the arrival of a, a harvest, if you will, of the first fruits of humanity. The people of Israel standing there at, at, at Sinai accepting the Torah, God has said, you, you just said it, you, you standing here today represent the, uh, the first fruits of, of my planting, uh, of taking from the soil and, and forming man. And after, after all these years, uh, three, you know, 3,338 years from Adam is a first fruits. It's a rival of these souls. And I, I would, I would think that in, in the days to come, may they come speedily that just as in those days, because they are fully, the Jewish people are, are going to be fully invested in the idea of Torah and they will recognize that right away. He calls them his firstborn. That's what he told Moses to tell Pharaoh. You tell, tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn. He could have said, Israel is my first fruits. And it would have been, it would have had the same, it, it means the same thing. And the 50, I love, I love the invoking of the number 50 because 50 is such a, a, a marvelous uh, number all through Torah, and it and it is is evoked in many concepts. See, yeah. also a very deep mystical spiritual concept of the fiftieth gate of wisdom, the fiftieth yeah. level. Fifty interpretations it's all, it's all of the of the of this. You can take fifty levels of interpretation of a Torah verse. And and curiously, when you read the construction of the ark and its dimensions, the ark of Noah, this vessel that would preserve humanity and its and its living beings and souls to repopulate the earth, you have the width of it being 50 cubits. And I think this the, isn't, isn't Israel itself even spoken of as a kind of ark that will save um, th this, uh, this nation from, from the, the, the clamors and the, 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 uh, the, the days that we face ahead. When people try to destroy the Jews, they will find safety within the ark called Israel. That's correct. Israel Hashem. You know that the um, the children of Israel, so they're encamped, right? They're encamped at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they had a very specific pattern of encampment. You know where where each tribe was to be. You know the, the Levim surrounded the tabernacle, and Yehuda, Yisachar, and Zvulun, and then from the south, Kahat, and Reuven, and Shimon, and Gad. They had this whole pattern of how they are traveling through the desert. You know, in their camp, and that actually is a very ancient pattern. Mm -hmm. It's amazing teaching that that our sages share with us, which which is that the the way that the that Yaakov's sons were standing around his bed, right at the time of his death, he arranged them and he gave them instructions to take up his coffin when he would depart from this world, and he commanded them in these very words: "Yehuda, Yisachar, Zul, and take up my coffin from the east, Reuven, Shimon, and God from the south." And it was like a prophecy that this is how he wanted them to be. Uh, positioned because this is how they're going to be positioned in, in their traveling as a nation. And then he, according to this Midrash, he said something very, very um, kind of difficult to understand, right? He said, if you do as I, as I command you, then the Holy One, blessed be he, will rest flags upon you. That's what he told them. And then we find in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 12, and his sons did for him exactly as he instructed them. So what is this talking about that it was important to him? He said, if you'll do as I tell you and, and, and camp exactly in this pattern, then God will reward you with flags. So somehow he knew how they would be camping and traveling and that they would be surrounding the Mishkan, the tabernacle, in the same way that they were surrounding his his bed, you know, and there was a whole order for their travels that Moshe had assigned. He knew when the cloud of glory that accompanied the camp was getting ready to move. And, and he would recite, you know, the verse from Numbers 10, 35, arise Hashem and let your enemies be dispersed. And then they would, they would uh, sound the trumpets. They would first, Yehuda would advance with his flag. So they, the tribes have these flags. Like Yaakov said, Hashem will give you flags. The tribes have these flags. Very important. Each flag has an ensign on it, you know, and each flag has a particular color. And the color of each flag is the same color as the, as the color of the stone of each tribe in the breastplate of Aaron. 
these flags, right? The flags of the tribes of Israel, I'm pretty sure are the oldest flags in the world. Yeah. Not only are they the oldest flags in the world, but they are the original flags. I think they're the first flags that were ever flown, according to the sages. All kingdoms that, that learned to make flags created them because of the flags of Israel in the desert. It was very, very unique. So, but where did this come from? This is such an unbelievable teaching, right? Where did, where did they get these flags? Like, okay, so Yaakov had some sort of a flash. She had some sort of a, of a you know, of a um, shining prophecy. And he said, you know, if, you, if you'll camp in this manner, like Hashem will reward you with flags. Not that I understand yet why that's important. And then we see, okay, they have these flags in the desert. But when, when did they first make them? When did they first make them? So it turns out that, the, that, they, that they first created these flags, the tribe of Israel, after they received the Torah. And their inspiration was that at Mount Sinai, when Hashem descended in his presence upon the mountain, this is what the Midrash says. You have to open up your heart in the deepest way. The Midrash says that they were, in, this is the language, innumerable legions of angels. Yeah. Yeah, that descended on Mount Sinai, and these camps of angels all had flags. Each camp of, e- of angels had a unique flag, and somehow from that moment, the sages say the children of Israel saw those flags, and they had this deep yearning that they should also have flags. They were they were inspired by the angels' flags. What does that even mean, you know? And in fulfillment of Yaakov's prophecy, Hashem gave them these flags. So always we understand that the teachings of our sages are, are a metaphor, you know, they are a poetic vehicle. And there must be a very profound idea that's being expressed here, because as you and I just finished saying, there's nothing more solid, more down to earth, more practical, more applicable than Torah. Torah is real as represented by the first fruits of the ground. It's very earthy, right? So what, what does this mean that, that Israel was inspired by the flags of the angels? They wanted to have their own flags. Like what, what is this? What is this really talking all about? Because it's, it seems to be, you know, we, we know that there are very deep lessons in terms of the, the pattern and the color of each of the flags, you know, of the, of the tribes. They convey the deepest secrets about the soul roots of the people. And, and we also know that the purpose of a flag is, is for identity. You know, that's what nationalism is all about, is collective identity. People, are caught, people rally around their flag. It's... it's um, it causes people to be single-mindedly focused on something. And so, and so the interesting thing, I think, that this Midrash is teaching us is the inspiration that the people of Israel had was from the angels. And they, and they felt a calling. They wanted to be like the angels. But what did the flag of the, of the angels represent? I mean, the flags of nations, right? This is the whole, the whole concept of nationalism. Nations have separate flags because... They're separate from each other, and that kind of is it. The flag is kind of like a way that emphasizes their specific national identity, but the flags of the angels have an opposite meaning. And this is so beautiful and intense in what our sages are conveying here. The flags of the angels were about nullifying their, themselves into the unity of Hashem. This is the idea that because an angel, everything that we learn about, about angels in the study of angels in Torah is that each angel only has one purpose, one yeah. very unique singular mission, right? Which is to fulfill Hashem's will. And they're totally unified. Yeah. And, and they don't have a sense of self and they don't have any kind of, kind of contradiction. And so when Israel saw those flags of the, of the angels, it was like they were obsessed with this idea that they also wanted to be able to, cling to Hashem with that level of unity and that, and that level of dedication and singularity. They wanted to be able to demonstrate that their life's purpose is totally nullified mm-hmm. to Hashem's will, which is, which is really what Shavuot is all about, which is what this week of Malchut is all about leading up to the, the insignia on that flag that represented the, the, um, the characteristics of, of each tribe, it was also, what, Rabbi, wasn't it also a way of saying that the uniqueness of each tribe, the, the particular 
uh, characteristics that, that God imbued each of those those brothers with, and, and even the, the people in the tribe were dedicated to that purpose of God, that their, exactly. their individual gifts would, the, the, even though they're distinct in their characteristics, uh, the, even though they're distinct, it did not separate them because they joined together, as you mentioned out, to, to dedicate those gifts to the service of God, because that was, that was their unity, was the service of God, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and that's what that's what Shavuot uh, brings us. And once again, it's a it's not about a memorial; it's about reliving. And and Hashem gave the Torah, but we all have the opportunity to be there again, and really bring it home, and really ask ourselves: Do we mean it? Are we really sincere? Are we really serious? Do I really want to do it this time? Do I really want to commit myself? And I think that this whole idea of the first fruits is so inspiring. First of all, it shows us that 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 um, Shavuot is really the festival of the land of Israel par excellence. It's, a, it's literally a celebration of the land of Israel because it's only in the land of Israel and not in Arkansas, no offense. Oh, not in, uh-huh. Certainly not in Massachusetts or even uh-huh. in New Jersey. <laughs> there is no first fruits. Occasionally people write to me and they, and they talk about, you know, that they want to, they want to bring first fruits from their land and in um, wherever they live, which is a very beautiful thought. And, and I think it's a wonderful feeling that a person has that they want to give something back to Hashem. But the concept of the, of the sanctification of the land is the land of Israel and the first fruits of the land of Israel. And that's what Shavuot really is, which shows us again, emphasizes to us the centrality of, of the land as bringing blessing, blessing to the whole world. And again, the whole, the whole idea, wherever a person is, of recognizing that the true celebration of Torah in this world, the true application, the true, the true understanding of Torah in this world is that it is about this world. It is about the very earthiness in which we function, in which we were created. It's about sanctifying that and bringing it back to Hashem and acknowledging Him in our lives. And it's and it's not about sitting in, a, in an ivory tower separate from all of humanity it's about interacting with people it's about planting and growing and bringing forth blessing from the earth because that's why hashem gave us torah so that we can observe it in this world yeah and uh, that's also such a such a beautiful idea but more than anything else you know uh, i also think it's important to remember that the torah is available to any person who really, really desires it. And Hashem is giving everyone the opportunity, especially in this generation, to make these incredible, incredible tikkunim, rectifications for the past, for, for who we have been. And that's what, that's what brings Mashiach. That's what is advancing the clock of the redemption. It's this, this resolve, this collective resolve, the unity of the flags of the angels that is, that is, that is growing, that we saw on Jerusalem Day, that we see with the Temple Mount Revolution, but that we see all over the world, Jim, that you represent, that so many incredibly highly motivated, beautiful souls that, that are connected to us through Jerusalem Lights, that they communicate with us and tell us what they're going through, how they feel, the stand that they're taking for Hashem. You know very well that this is unprecedented, what we're yeah. seeing in our generation of non-Jews as well turning to Torah. And so I, I want to uh, I want to uh, bless everyone that we should all be there at Mount Sinai and it's going to be crowded. So try to get there early. Don't go to sleep and uh, get yourself a good spot. And the thing is that you know it's also the the birthday as well as the anniversary of the death of King David. Really? Shavuot is the art site's birthday and the anniversary of the death of King David, which is one of the reasons why we study the book of Ruth on Shavuot right. as well. There are many other reasons as well, but that's one reason. And the whole idea is King David, who is uh, the perennial righteous leader of Israel by way of the fact that he's also the herald of messianic potential and redemption, that is about renewing our covenant with Hashem, about receiving Torah anew, about taking responsibility for our own actions, about living for divine purpose, and uh, bringing the light of Torah into our own lives. And that is exactly what we're called upon to do. And we can do it. And it's happening. It's happening with joy and with tremendous, like I say, resolve and 
maybe so. May we all be there and may we, may we redouble our efforts to sanctify Hashem's name and, and bring the Torah and plant it firmly in this world and live by it. Amen. Amen. Chag Shemeach, Rabbi. Chag Shemeach to you, to all our listeners, to the whole world. Chag Shemeach.